<laughs> David, are you dreaming of a white Christmas? Oh, did you see that video? <laughs> I did. Nice. Very nice. I'm a little little anxious about tonight's show. Oh, how come? This is the first podcast episode 100% powered by Apple Silicon. <laughs> and I had full confidence going into it until about two minutes ago when I sat down at the computer and and I was about to jump in our, our Discord channel and my my MacBook Pro did not see my external uh, audio interface. And so I had to actually unplug everything and plug it back in for it to recognize it. Huh. You think that was an Apple Silicon issue or just USB? I don't know. I went into the sound preferences and it didn't have any sound output options other than just the MacBook Pro speakers. So I couldn't output to my LG Ultrafine display or my audio interface. So it seems like it might have been some kind of audio controller issue. Yeah, it sounds like a big sir issue. Well, hopefully one that won't pop up in the middle of of actually recording Mm. um i had woken it from sleep and it didn't recognize anything so hopefully it's just something to do with that i think we'll be okay once we get going we very rarely had interruptions due to technical issues before have we uh no and the few we have you've been very good about patching over in the edit (laughs) sometimes losing huge chunks of show but who notices? <laughs> so I'm pretty I'm pretty excited to see uh, what you have to say about this first bullet point you added. This looks like it's a follow up from a conversation we had a few episodes ago. Mm. Yeah, a few shows ago. Of course, I just completely forgot about it. Actually, no, no, I didn't completely forget about it. I um. So yeah, this is the photo zoom versus photo crop. So we were ask we were wondering if you take a photo, if you take two photos. One digitally zoomed, and then another at regular zoom, but then cropped to be the same as digital zoom. Mm -hmm. Do you end up with the same photo, or does the iPhone be smart about extra processing on the one that it knows is digitally zoomed? Did I get that right? Because even as we were describing it in the original show, I got confused about three times about what (laughs) the actual test was. Yeah, that was the basic question. Right, okay. Uh, so the reason it's taken so long is that I thought, oh, actually, I'm going to do this properly and get like a tripod mount for my phone so it's extra still. And I, mm-hmm. I think I ordered that the day after the show and it's still not here. So then I oh, just wow. thought, well, I thought, actually, we must have done it before we had iPhone 12s because I just realized, well, I can just put the phone on its side now and it stands up. So it, it is going to be still. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a nice little benefit of having a flat sided phone. Mm-hmm. But anyway... To the results, um, one thing I didn't consider is that there aren't a lot of megapixels in an iPhone photo already. So when you crop it heavily, you basically just, you can't really tell because there are so few pixels to compare that you're just looking at pixels. You can't discern any detail anymore or noise because they're just, you know, you're down to like a one and a half or two megapixel photo. <laughs> Once you right. crop it really heavily to the same level as like a 5x digital zoom. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess if you wanted to draw a conclusion from this, it's take your photos with the digital zoom if that's what you intend to do because then you'll at least have a 12 megapixel photo and you'll be able to do something with it. Ah, okay. So it ended up looking about the same? It was hard to say. I guess they actually looked quite different, I would say. Oh, really? Yeah. But it's it was like, yeah, comparing all... Actually, let, let me see exactly. Oh, no, I deleted the photo already. Um, yeah, it was like comparing a very low resolution photo with a, a higher 12 megapixel resolution photo. So it's hard to really mm. make a judgment on on anything besides the fact that one is much higher resolution. Right. So the consensus is then digital zoom is better than cropping. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah, which is the opposite of how I uh, have always kind of intuitively thought about taking photos. If I had to use digital zoom, I always opted just to not zoom and crop later. Mm. 
And if you're only ever going to look at them on your phone, I guess it doesn't really matter that much. But if you're looking at them on, or if you're printing them, like if you if you had a 12 megapixel photo and you cropped it heavily, the mm. actual size of it is just going to be so small it probably wouldn't even fill an A4 sheet. So then any upscaling to print it, you're going to start seeing the pixels instead of the detail. I was just thinking the other day, what really needs to make a comeback are uh, digital photo frames. Those were, at least in my neck of the woods, extremely popular in like the mid 2000s, like 2005, 2006, everyone had a digital photo frame, but they are really inconvenient to use, especially at that time when most consumers were just maybe beginning to transition to digital cameras. So to scan your photos in, put them on a thumb drive, and then bring that thumb drive over the digital photo frame to transfer them on to use, made it so you basically did it one time, and then you had the same handful of photos on a slideshow forever. But nowadays, and I'm sure these exist, but you could have like photo frames that connect to your smartphones, and you could just send photos off either manually or they can sync to your iCloud or Google Photo library and constantly updating. And I think those would be really nice to have again. Digital photo frames killed their own market. They like shot themselves in the foot just by being so bad from the very beginning. <laughs> right. yeah. They're always such terrible screens stuck in the worst, hideous, ugly frames. Mm-hmm. They had like terrible user interfaces. You had to be like a software engineer just to, you know, to configure it correctly. Right. Uh, the, the color reproduction was awful. Uh, there must be some good ones out there that actually have decent high resolution screens. And maybe it is just yeah. that everyone buys like the cheapest of the cheap. And so all I've ever seen is the junk, which just belong in the bin. I haven't actually seen anyone purchase digital, fo- digital photo frame in probably at least a decade now. Uh, but I take so many photos and I was just thinking the other day, it's like, yeah, I only ever get to look at them on my phone whenever I feel a little nostalgic and want to go back seven years or whatever in my photos and look at old pictures. It'd be really cool to have a photo frame like that, maybe a couple around the house that's just going through maybe my favorites album so that I can always see these old photos that I've taken. So I'm, I actually will take a look at this. I want to see if there are any because... The more I talk about it, the more appealing that sounds. Apple kind of solved the problem by building this into the iPad at one point. It's it's been removed. But there used to be a button on the lock screen, which was just a a flower, I think, and you hit it and it started a photo slideshow. Right, yeah. And the iPad would, you know, I think I had it sitting on like one of the docks at the time. So it would be charging, it would be showing photos. But... You just had to remember to tap the flower every time you set it down on the dock so it would start the slideshow. And then, of course, it would go all night and it was probably destroying the battery and the longevity of the device. Mm-hmm. The closest thing they have to that now is uh, Apple TV screensavers. You can choose albums to go through. Right. That's the only one I've really seen take off. I think in, uh, in my family, at least, people seem to like the photo screensavers from the Apple TV. Mm-hmm. Okay, but so the... digital photo frames are very much a thing still. At least if you search on Amazon, there's quite a few. And they seem to be much higher quality than I remember them being. Um, and they're also selling for much higher price. These aren't the $20, $30 frames. They're, they go for a couple hundred dollars now for a good 1080p Wi-Fi picture frame. And you can get some pretty big ones. There's 15-inch ones and 10-inch ones. I might have to pull a trigger on a couple of these. 1080p is not enough for a photo frame of any size. You don't think so? I don't think so. Even if it's just 1080p, it's it's getting to see these photos that I otherwise they just sit in my photo library I never get to look at. And what's the problem with just having them on your TV? Uh, well, I my TV's never on, so oh, I okay. suppose I could just always have the slideshow going. But if you're going to complain about resolution, my television is 720p. <laughs> okay. So... There's an issue. <laughs> a little bit. The best solution I saw was the Samsung TV. And we've talked about it on the show. But I don't remember the model or anything, but it... Uh, oh, right. 
actually, I don't really remember anything about it, except that it looked like a photo hanging on the wall when the TV was in, like, not mm. use mode, when it wasn't showing TV, or moving images. Right, yeah, I don't know if that was an aspect of the display that made it look so much like just a photo. I know that all the pictures I saw of it, it had some kind of decorative frame around it as well that really enhanced the look. Yeah, that's right. It was about $5,000. Mm-hmm. I think the direction that this is going is that smart screens in the house, and I'm not talking TVs, but more like assistants will do this, and they already do do this. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah, I think that's the future for digital photo frames. Apple just needs to make some version of the HomePod with a screen on it. I'm sure they'll Maybe. get there. Someday. I mean, I've debated just buying an iPad mini and using it as a, a smart assistant, like plugged into a mm-hmm. a small speaker system or something. But see, even that wouldn't fill the the whole of smart photo frame because you would have to start a slideshow every time you set it down and weren't using it. That's true. I wonder if there's some kind of automation through shortcuts or something that you could have it trigger. Mm, like maybe, but then it would also always have to be unlocked. And I True. wouldn't know to not do it at night. There's so many things to consider. <laughs> no wonder these haven't taken over the world. It's just such a complex problem to solve. <laughs> <laughs> so did you buy a MacBook Air last week? I did, yeah. That's not the next thing on mm-hmm. the list, though. We've got my iPhone predictions to go over first. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a really quick topic because I okay. struggled. I really struggled to try and come up with anything. Uh that would blow anyone's socks off with like how good my prediction abilities is. <laughs> uh, so I've come up with four things, uh, none of which are earth shattering or really even interesting. Uh, I think it's going to have a uh, promotion. <laughs> I think that'll probably just come next year. So this mm-hmm. is supposed to be for what year? Like 2024? It's supposed to be six years in the future. Oh, it's supposed to be a six year prediction. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I'll have a real edge-to-edge screen, so no notch and not even any bezels. Okay. Uh, I th- I think it's going to have two-way Qi charging, so you can rest your okay. AirPods on the back and it'll charge them. Uh-huh. Uh, and the last one I could come up with is it's going to have like a, a real telephoto lens. Not, not what we call a telephoto now, but more like a 150 millimeter equivalent lens. Like the periscope lenses. Something like that, yeah. Hmm. That's that's sad that all the predictions for iPhone six years from now are things that already exist on phones today. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, yeah. I didn't think of that. <laughs> oh, man, it's a real struggle. Yeah, I asked Yasmin as well, and she came up with something interesting, although she said it's probably more like 2034. Uh, okay. She said the the phone is going to start as like a small... Uh, a small bar and then when you go to use it the screen slides up from the bottom uh, and it's like a transparent piece of glass <laughs> with a oh, like bezel on top and bottom yeah that sounds similar to uh, what was it that, that scroll scroll phone did you see that scroll phone I think I yeah that. TCL is, is was working on one it's uh another concept on kind of like the folding display idea except instead of it folding flat it's uh it rolls up like a scroll kind of around a spring-loaded mechanism Hmm. okay and so you you kind of pull it out to use it it's incredibly ugly (laughs) it rolls up to something like the size of a sausage roll (laughs) oh i think you may be looking at an older idea because there's one that uh it starts out looking like a, a basic brick phone uh, and then through some mechanism, the screen expands out to about tablet size. Ah, uh, okay. I'm seeing TCLs now. Yeah, I was seeing something else. Uh, okay. Yeah, that looks nice. Yeah. Now, to the point of it starts out as a tiny, thin slab and the whole screen comes out. I, I, it seems backwards to, to make phones more, uh, to have more moving parts and to be more mechanical in that way. But it seems to be kind of the way we're going right now. Until that sci-fi future of just having a transparent piece of glass. Yasmin's just walked into the room so she can hear. <laughs> <laughs> the transparent piece of glass is very futuristic, wouldn't you say? 
What, what year do you predict it coming in? 2030. There we go. <laughs> From the horse's mouth. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, hopefully we're still around in 10 years to talk about it. (laughs) I hope so too. 10 years is going (laughs) to fly by in an instant. Oh, yeah. If we're going to talk about time flying, we're, what, one episode away from finishing up three years of podcasting? No way. Wow. Yeah. Been doing this for three years, almost starting our fourth year now. I can't believe you put up with me that long. (laughs) I can't believe this, uh, this idea. Um stuck with both of us and just uh yeah kept going yeah it's been a lot of fun yeah wow three years are we going to do something to celebrate you're gonna fly out to perth borders are open now oh really the last i heard is that if you'd fly in australia you'd like be quarantined for two weeks or something before you could actually be out and about Mm, actually probably internationally yeah i'd say so but nationally it's uh a little bit more open than that no quarantine period (laughs) One of these days, we'll do uh, like a quote-unquote live where we're both in the same room show. Mm. We, yeah, we absolutely have to do that. Maybe that can be a, a, a video podcast. Yeah, okay, yep. <laughs> yeah, it would, it would have to be. Put it up on YouTube. Yeah, that'd be fun. People can hear all the awkward silences firsthand because it's going to be too hard to edit them all out like I do with the audio show. Oh, yeah, the video would be hard. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> all right macbook air i'm ready to hear about your take on the macbook air um all right well just to to talk about the macbook air itself forgetting that is it's a uh, apple silicon computer because i um haven't had a a modern macbook air before of any variety not since like a maybe a 2011 model or something um but the the build quality of the computer is just phenomenal really mm-hmm. it is it's just so light and so small and it tapers nicely the hinge mechanism and like the way that the screen opens up is just mm-hmm. it makes my 2015 macbook pro feel like a plastic compact from the early thousands it's, it's just so nice to use <laughs> what wait what's so special about this hinge just well nothing's special about it and anyone that's used i guess the macbook pro or since 2016 whenever they did the last redesign Mm -hmm. or this new macbook air will know that it it's just so refined that it makes even the 2015 macbooks and macbook pros feel like junk when they're actually not junk they're actually very good as well right so I'm not saying there's anything new or magical about it. It's just that the the build quality of the of the whole unit is just supreme. Um I got the gold one. Ooh, bold choice. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't call it a choice. I went to the okay. Apple store and I said, uh, you know, can I have one of the new M1 MacBook Airs? And they said, well they she spent a little while on her iPad and said we we have one base level MacBook Air in gold. That's the only thing we have here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Would you like that? <laughs> and also, it's a two hour wait for it. <laughs> wait, a two hour wait for them to go to the back room and get it out for you? I know. And I was at the shopping center with Paul and Johannes, you know, a two year old mm-hmm. and a zero year old. So I was like, oh, I was actually on the fence about even waiting. Right. Um, but we went and found something to do and. In the meantime, they actually SMSed me an appointment link to my phone as I was walking around the shopping center and I actually had a, an appointment time that was even further in the future. So at that point, maybe when I saw that in about an hour after, an hour into mm-hmm. the two hour wait, which had turned into like a two and a half hour wait, I just went back and said like, I, I can't wait around this long. I've got to get home because I have a job to do. I have work. Mm-hmm. Um, and she said, all right, just just stand here in line instead. Um, it's a little bit less busy than before. And so I only waited in line like five minutes in the end, and then they called me in and brought the laptop out. So How was, busy are your Apple stores that you have a two-hour wait to get a box from the back room? They're not that busy. I mean, it's not like they're packed with people. Actually, they, they're definitely not packed with people because they Apple still follows like 
the strictest letter of coronavirus restrictions you could, even though no one else in the shopping center does. Mm -hmm. So there's still the the head thermometer check, temperature check, the face masks, a limited number of people in the store, probably limited staff as well. I don't know. Is it because they wanted to like have a sit down consult with here's all the new stuff about the computer with you? God, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, while I stood there awkwardly with the, the sales rep, while someone actually went down to the back or got the box, mm-hmm. uh, you know, she asked me a few questions about the computer. But then uh, once it came out, it was just scan, pay and go. That was it. Very odd. Mm. So you went with the, the very base configuration. That's the only thing they had. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and in gold. But, so here's the thing. Mm-hmm. I've just fallen in love with the gold color. It's It just looks amazing. Yeah. Uh, if Well, I'll get to this, but I, I'm going to buy another one. And I'm going to actually choose gold on purpose. Oh, okay. It'll, it's, it's really, really attractive. It actually looks quite different depending on what light you've got shining so i would say under most lights it actually looks more bronze than gold and then under some certain lights maybe like tungsten lights or very warm lights it can look quite pink Mm -hmm. um but yeah i think just when you look at it i'd probably call it a bronze computer rather than a gold computer but yeah i would um, highly recommend anyone who just discounted the gold to have another look at it yeah apple changes their colors so often there's been a couple times that that in my mind apple's really hit it out of the park with their gold colored phones i think the gold for the iphone 8 and 10s their blush gold was really good and it sounds similar mm-hmm. to what you're describing for your macbook air as well i wasn't a big fan of their idea of gold back when they really had gold and rose gold i didn't like how gold the iphone 6 and 6s was um and I haven't seen a 12 in person, but from the photos, it looks like they've really nailed gold for the iPhone 12 as well, or the 12 Pro. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I can't remember the iPhone 12 enough to compare it to the MacBook Air. Right. But I can highly recommend the Air's gold. Um, just continuing on non-Apple Silicon-related comments on the computer, but mm-hmm. the the speaker performance also kind of shocked me a little bit. Really? It's uh, the, I mean, the actual speaker grills are like a centimeter wide, <laughs> centimeter strips down the right hand side of the keyboard and the height of the keyboard. So when you look at it, you don't expect to get much out of them. But even compared to the 2017 MacBook Pro I had, I think the, like the, the width of the audio is, is really noticeable. Like when you are listening to something that you, like, you expect to come out of like a centered channel it actually sounds like it's coming from the center of the computer and then also like audio that you expect to hear like from say you're watching a movie and something happens like way left of screen Mm -hmm. it almost seems like the audio is coming from outside the edge of the computer so it's got this really nice presence to the audio to it so i was really impressed with that it uh yeah destroys other computers probably not the pro the new pros but uh and certainly any older uh macbooks wow yeah apple's been knocking out of the park with with speakers as well the fidelity might be slightly worse than the macbook pros actually i've only ever had the 2017 macbook pro so that's it's gone back a few years hard to compare hard to draw that out of my memory because that one i also remembered thinking it was phenomenal when i first heard it Mm mm-hmm yeah, they've had industry-leading speakers for at least a decade now, it seems. Yeah, like once they... Wasn't the I, the large iPad the first one to get, like, these crazy speakers? I think it was the maybe the first 12-inch. And when you saw a breakdown or a, um, like an X-ray view of the iPad, or, or mm-hmm. if you looked at it open, the speakers were like these... Like, took up a lot of internal space of the iPad. They're kind of like right. this... Yeah, flat, not discs, but like quarter circles. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember that being like the first device from them that took a huge leap forward in in uh, speaker quality. And that was 2015, 
the first iPad Pro came out? Mm. Yeah, 2015. Yeah, it could be. So yeah, at least five years they've been doing really good with speakers then. Um, on to more Apple Silicon related observations with the computer. And this is something you said last week, of course, the the battery life of it is pretty insane. Right. Yeah. Unbelievable. The first time I noticed it, I had been watching some streaming sport. So I watch, uh, yeah, I watch a lot of streaming sport. Uh, and on the 2015 MacBook Pro, I can get like maybe an hour and three quarters using the streaming sport website. It's just like a, a stream through Safari, but you know, it heats up the computer and it destroys the battery. And I don't think on any like code of sport that I watch, I'd actually be able to watch a full game without the battery running out. <laughs> so I don't know what it is about this website, but it, it's, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, like it's just streaming video and YouTube doesn't do the same thing. So I don't know why watching something that's live would actually have an effect on it. But, uh, so I watched, I think it was a game of cricket, which is like three hours on the M1 MacBook Air. And actually, I, I hadn't even had it on charge before that. And I'd been watching something else, maybe something local, done a bit of work. And after the match, I thought, I'll oh, just check the battery and see how close it is to dead because there's no way 2015 MacBook Pro would actually be alive at the moment. And it was at mm-hmm. 95% still. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah. Yeah. It's oh, just in another league. It is head and shoulders above anything else I've ever used, including iOS right. devices. Yeah, it changes the way that I'm... It changes my expectations from computers for from now on. I could never go back to a, a Windows computer that only lasts a couple hours on a charge. No, no way. It did. It changes the, the way I use the... Or not... Yeah, I guess the way I use the computer because previously, like at night it would be habit just to go and plug the computer in because I knew that if I woke up in the morning and it wasn't plugged in, it would probably just have, you know, idled itself to, uh, to 0% anyway, because it was probably already close to that. Uh, but you don't have to worry about that anymore. You know, just chuck it on the table like you would do with an iPad and it'll be ready to go in the morning with instant wake as well. Yeah. And the resale value you get from that. That's one of the big numbers that people seem to care about when you go sell a used computer is the battery cycle count. Yeah, and it's so, definitely a factor. Yeah, that's going to be way lower on these used computers in a couple of years. Uh, and finally, the performance of the computer. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, this is where I, I change from positives to negatives. Because, Uh-oh. yeah. Uh, so I'm not actually using the computer at the moment because it's it uh, it's not really fast enough for me. <laughs> which sounds really? ridiculous. But I don't know if it's the computer or Lightroom, <laughs> but it is just not able to deal with Lightroom at all. Possibly due to just having eight gig of RAM, because so so you might have seen I actually posted a video of uh, comparing uh, the my twenty fifteen and the M one on YouTube. Did you see that? No, I didn't see that. Okay, subscribe to you. I'm surprised it didn't come across my feed. Ah, I've been having all sorts of problems uploading to YouTube recently, so you know, okay. yeah, don't worry about it. Um, so the, yeah, the very first day that I got the computer, I did some tests in Lightroom on both of them. Um, so Lightroom was still is Lightroom Classic is still a translated app, so it runs through Rosetta, mm-hmm. and yeah, the M1 handily beat the 2015 at uh, pretty much every test, well, at every test, by probably almost twice as fast. But the problem I've come to realize is that my testing scenario wasn't comprehensive enough or wasn't realistic enough. It was more like a simulated test. So I would just you know, import 20 files, build previews for 20 files and export 20 files. Each time I would like restart Lightroom to make sure it hadn't done any hadn't like gone crazy just to reset like the testing parameters um and i was also doing like test one computer then the other computer and then go back so the computers had time to cool down and that um so yeah uh, at the end of that day day one i thought well there's there's no question here the m1 is handily beating 
the 2015 on all fronts. Uh, mm-hmm. So, sorry, you know, I, I set it up as my main computer and I started using it. And then once I actually started using Lightroom, the computer just started to like choke and get hot, like really hot uh, and throttle itself like crazy to the point where like the mouse cursor isn't moving around smoothly on the screen anymore. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, swap use, swap file is like, is just exploding. Um, mm-hmm. Battery life, like when you look at activity monitor, it's just like falling off a cliff. And this is not even like editing like a, like a job. I'm just doing like, took some photos around around home, like 30, 40 photos, not like hundreds or even a thousand that I'll get out of like an actual job. Right. And uh, it's just not able to cope with it. So I thought, well, maybe it is just the fact that it's a translated app. But mm-hmm. handily, uh, Adobe actually released native Lightroom last night. So I was able to do some more tests. Okay. And it was actually exactly the same. It was no better. So even the native Apple Silicon Lightroom uh, was, uh, yeah, it it just killed the computer. It was unusable after a couple of minutes. Um, Theory-wise, I can... My my leading theory at the moment is that 8 gig of RAM is just not enough to deal with Lightroom. Uh, so I really need to just try an M1 computer with 16 gig of RAM and see if it has a noticeable effect. Mm-hmm. But but certainly the one I've got with me at the moment has to be returned to the shop because I can just get more done on the 2015, which sounds unusual and not like most people's experiences. Although I did find... You know, that the one solitary Reddit post from someone who was having a similar issue. So, um, <laughs> it's not just like my setup. I th- I'm pretty sure. Um, well, you said that it takes a couple minutes before it really starts to choke. Maybe what you actually need is the active cooling of the MacBook Pro to solve for this issue. Mm-hmm. That is another consideration. Yeah. Hmm. Because most people have said, like, even exporting from Final Cut Pro at 4K, yet, like, the computer doesn't heat up. And yet, right. a couple of minutes in Lightroom, and you don't want to touch it because it's just so hot. Wow. Yeah, that's so different from any of the other reviews I've heard. Right. Yeah, I don't know. So so you're returning it for a 16 gig MacBook Air? That's your next step? I think that'll be my next step. So, actually, I originally thought, if this computer really works out well, then... I'm just going to get like the ideal computer for me, which is the MacBook Air plus 16 gig of RAM and a terabyte of storage. Mm-hmm. It wasn't available when I went into the store, but that would, that would probably do me for quite a few years, I think. So that was kind of the original plan anyway. And, it's, okay. and now my only reservation is, what if it's not the 16 gig of RAM and I actually need the fans? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so should I go into the Apple store and like quickly download Creative Cloud and install Lightroom and bring along a little SD card reader and do the whole test there. I don't know. I mean, that's the exact kind of thing the Apple store would be totally okay with you doing. Yeah, yeah. If there's any shop that's going to let me do it, it's going to be them. Right. So that'd be interesting and probably save you some headache if it does end up being, you know, a cooling issue more than a RAM issue. Yeah, it would save me a bit of a runaround, wouldn't it? So do you think if the RAM doesn't solve the problem, you'd... you'd try to go for a pro or do you think you'd give up on apple silicon for the time being at that point i reckon i would just wait for adobe to to fix the issue right because surely a computer with eight gig of ram even should be able to export and run lightroom without like burning itself to a crisp right so if it came to that i think i'd probably just put it all on the back burner for six or nine months and then revisit it and see if anything's changed on on the software front because also i I want to use lightroom classic which is not the one that they optimized that they uh yeah Mm -hmm. for apple silicon that one's still running translated i don't even know if it's possible to buy in in this configuration if you get the 16 gig model does that automatically mean you're going to get an extra gpu core as well yeah uh no because you can configure the the seven core GPU one with 16 gig of RAM. Uh, okay. Is that what you'd opt for? Or are you going to try to add the GPU core as well? 
I may as well just get the GPU core. Why not? Right. I think you're paying like 50 bucks. If you configure them both the same, yeah, I think that's like mm-hmm. a $50 difference. Australian, so $30 US. I mean, if we're going to play the why not, then we should just get the Pro now. I don't like the touch bar, though. I don't even want a touch bar. <laughs> just configure it to show function keys by default. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess the the one touch bar computer I did have for a little while was like pre-physical escape key. So maybe things right. have changed because I had that issue where just the way that I rest my hands is always hitting the escape key. So that was infuriating. Although I don't like the fact that it goes to sleep. Like you have to wake it up to, to do things on it. Man, I just love the touch bar. Oh, really? I found my, I found myself actually sitting at my desk earlier in the week and browsing twitter or something and and in some thread there was people just railing on the touch bar as always the touch bar can't come up in a conversation without just everyone saying it's terrible and and i was thinking i really like the touch bar and i don't want it to go away maybe i should write like craig federici an email and tell him how much i appreciate the touch bar so that they know there's people that that like it still yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he's probably got a folder specifically for like pro touch bar related emails and he's got like four emails in there <laughs> so sell me on it then what am i missing man i i am probably not the salesperson for someone who wants a, a practical reason to like the touch bar because <laughs> because i am a very much like ooh, it's it's shiny and cool and i and it's just it it looks neat um I mean, there's a few practical things I really like about it. I like that I can see previews of the tabs I have open in Safari, so I can tap right into the window. It's a little bit more information than just the page title you see actually in the Safari window itself. Um, I always put a sleep button on my touch bar. I replace usually the Siri button with it because putting my computer to sleep without actually closing the laptop lid is something that I do quite frequently. And the control shift escape shortcut. Uh, actually, I don't know if it works anymore. It didn't work when there wasn't a physical escape key. Now there's a physical escape key, it might work again. Hmm. But I like having just the one button solution anyway, instead of having to hold three keys to put my computer to sleep. And and then besides that, it's just cool. I don't actually have a lot of practical use I get out of it. It does look pretty cool, doesn't it? The way I wish they would implement it. Mm-hmm is that they would actually still have all the physical keys there, but the keycaps would each be an individual screen. Okay. So you had all the benefits of the physical, the tactile key pushes, Mm -hmm. and then you'd have most of the benefits of just being able to customize it as you see fit. You're giving up things like sliding and uh, uh, modular buttons, but I think that would look way cooler. Man, what if just every key was a screen? Yeah, all that. That would be cool. Either that or like a... a there was there was patents published that Apple was, was working on. This is a long time ago. Where it was basically a double-screened MacBook Pro. But the lower screen had like raised ridges. So even though it was technically a screen, you could feel the individual buttons still. Mm. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Because I could never go to fully typing on glass or or whatever. No, as shown in previous MacBooks, like even keys with very minimal travel are much harder to type on than keys with more travel. Right. So imagine having no travel. I mean, I can imagine it on my iPad Pro, and I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> my touch typing goes right out the window. What do you think, even if each key was outlined... But there was no travel. So you could feel each individual key, mm-hmm. but you would only tap it. I don't know. I'd have to try it. That might work because I, I was never especially bothered by the ultra low travel, like butterfly keyboards. I, I found those quite comfortable. And the actual practical difference between that and no travel is, is very minimal. And they could definitely fake travel with the Taptic engine if they wanted to. And it'd probably feel exactly the same. Mm, there's the thought. Mm-hmm. The, the only butterfly keyboard that I think actually was difficult to type on was the very original Retina MacBook because that had the 
least travel of all the keyboards that right. they released and and that was actually tricky to type on i thought i don't know that i ever got a chance to type on that one so i'll take your word for it but taptic response hmm could be mm. onto something there <laughs> wait i'm gonna stick that in my 2026 iphone predictions raised what? ridges on screen when keyboard is shown and taptic response <laughs> man more mechanical pieces yeah, it's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, so you've put in here uh, Logitech Circle View wired doorbell and then bullet point, no. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this by saying for anyone listening who's been waiting for a home kit doorbell, you're welcome. Because I have been waiting for a home kit enabled doorbell like a real consumer focused one that wasn't $500 or whatever, just a standard home kit, secure video doorbell for years. I've wanted a smart doorbell forever and I never wanted to get one until there was one that worked with home kit. And I gave up after years of waiting and on a black Friday sale just a week ago, I bought a Google nest. Hello, smart doorbell only to get it in the mail yesterday and install it on my front door yesterday evening and then wake up this morning to an actual home kit smart door veil available for sale. Oh, gee, that's just the worst <laughs> timing. Yeah, so I'm, I'm in a real pickle now because I don't know if I, if I want to go through the effort of taking that smart doorbell down and sending it back or, or just gritting my teeth and... and dealing with it for the next few years you're not gonna find true happiness in life unless you've got an actual home kit doorbell sorry to say i know i do have a small workaround though i got a canary hub i think we've talked about this in the show in the past it was like seven or eight months ago and it's a, a an intermediary interface between google's nest and apple home kit stuff and it's not officially sanctioned by either company but it's connected to my Google account and it makes all of my cameras appear as HomeKit cameras in the Home app. So I get all the functionality, well, most of the functionality of HomeKit cameras, including this new doorbell. So when my doorbell rings, my HomePods ring, which was the, the big thing I really, that had to happen. Uh, and that works. Uh, what I don't get is the uh, HomeKit secure video features Right, which that's are, what I was going to ask. Right, so that it would be all of my video being encrypted locally on one of my devices, whether it's my Apple TV or um, uh, HomePod or whatever, doing encrypting and then storing it in my iCloud account. Instead, I have to pay Google separately for uh, video history. Is that something that you use, though? Do you ever go back and look at old videos? I guess it could be handy. Like you might not, you might use it once a year, but just to have right. it there. Right. That's pretty much how I feel about it. One of my security cameras is on the side of my house. And it's watching my cars. And with my luck, how this has played out, the, the day I decide that I don't look at my history, I'm going to stop paying for it. Is the day, like the middle of the night, someone like tries to break into my car or something. And then I can't go back and see what happened. Mm, so, yeah, yeah. It's actually not that expensive, and I was already paying for it for my external cameras, and so the doorbell gets included in that package with no extra cost. So I'm not out extra money by keeping this doorbell that I already have. Was it much of a task to install it? Uh, no, it was actually especially easy for me because the doorbell it was replacing is a was a wireless doorbell. So instead of having to get into the chime box and putting in the like, little smart... I don't know. It's a little puck that you wire into the chime itself so that when the doorbell rings, it, it rings the old chime. Uh, in this case, I had to get an adapter that plugs into the wall uh, to power the doorbell because I don't have doorbell wires to power the doorbell itself. <laughs> this is all like Greek to me. It's such a foreign object. I've got no idea how a doorbell works. My doorbell okay. is there's a button on one side of the door and on the opposite side of the door, there's a bell. <laughs> so it's like a, a mechanical bell. thing where you're actually physically hitting a bell when you press the button. 
Correct. Interesting. Le- you're pushing a lever which goes ding. <laughs> and there's okay. one unit so, that goes through the door. <laughs> so generally how doorbells have worked up until the last 15 years or so when wireless ones have become popular, there's you've this chime that's located usually in a pretty central place in the house. Um, and that could be a digital chime or an actual physical bell. Uh, and there's a servo that either hits the hits the bell itself or uh, turns on the chime circuitry. And there's just two power leads that go to that servo that lead out to the bell. And pressing the button just connects it together and powers that servo. And it's hmm. fairly high voltage that actually runs through <laughs> that wire. High enough voltage to power a smart doorbell if you wanted to. And that was that's basically how smart doorbells work. The problem is in the last 15 years, they've all become wireless where you just have a little battery inside the doorbell button itself. Uh, so to power a smart doorbell, you have to add the wiring yourself. Right, so there's, there's power going to the camera unit at the door mm-hmm. via the, you know, what was there connecting it before. And then mm-hmm. does that unit also have the Wi-Fi in it? Right. Yeah. The, the smart doorbell itself is an all-in-one solution. So it'll connect to the Wi-Fi. So there's no other component. Right. And the bell, the bell component from the old doorbell is now defunct. Uh, no, in wired, so- in wired solutions, that's generally still usable. Okay. And it'll, it'll work with the new smart doorbell. Oh, so the smart doorbell will still finish the loop to, to kick off the servos. Right. And that's usually why you need the little extra puck added on to the, to the chime on the inside. Because the smart doorbell powering itself means it is completing the circuit and would always be ringing the doorbell that way. Ah, so right. The, so is that... the little circuit you add in uh, sends power, but then pressing the button tells it itself to close the circuit inside the chime to make it go off. And does it get the signal wirelessly or via the power? Uh, that's a good question. I suppose it could work either way, but I assumed it's it's via the power. Hmm. So it's not trivial to replace it with this Logitech one. <laughs> well, it, it'd be trivial for me because I don't have a wired doorbell. So it'd be literally just taking the two power wires that I have that don't go to a chime and connecting it to this instead. Ah, okay. And you're allowed to do your own electrical work. So that's fine. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't believe something like replacing a doorbell would be considered something you need a professional to do. <laughs> I wonder what voltage is going through it. Uh that's a good question. I can tell you that the 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 power that I added going to um the smart doorbell. I want to say it was like 8 volts or something. It wasn't that high. Oh, okay. It was only good. like a couple amps too. Like one and a half. You probably wouldn't need an electrician for that. Okay. I'm just Googling it just to check. I have no idea. Anyway. Australian wide doorbells tend to require 8 volts. That's all I can find. Okay. I mean, that's a harmless voltage. Right. You get batteries with more voltage. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's the end of the uh, follow-up segment of the show. Okay. (laughs) We do have two topics to talk about, though. (laughs) <laughs> all right good morning good morning <laughs> at least good morning good morning. just get later and later in the show recently yeah uh, i don't know maybe we need to rejig the format a little bit start moving more stuff to like a post show or i could just take the good morning and move it to the start of the show <laughs> yeah so there's just a a, a bit of dead air where the good morning was. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, around 14 hours ago, Apple announces announced AirPods Max. So there was a rumor that there was going to be a hardware announcement this week, and right. it came true, which is cool because I, don't, I didn't really expect anything you know, coming up mid-December. Uh, but they have announced the AirPod, AirPods Max, which are the often rumoured, over the head, over the ear, AirPods. You'd barely call them AirPods. They're headphones. It's going to be 
be weird for a little while at least to call them AirPods. Because, you know, they look nothing like AirPods. Uh, but that's the branding, it seems, for Apple's headphones. So that's what we're going with. Um, the very first thing I noticed was that they have the digital crown from the Apple Watch. It looks like identical one-for-one one replica. So the digital crown is now your volume control. Uh, and Apple sells it as a uh, ultra-precise volume knob or something like that. Uh, and the... I can see where that'd be more precise. Yeah. Rumors leading up yeah. to this were saying that these could potentially have touch-sensitive sides and swiping across a surface is not going to be a very precise way to control volume, whereas a very physical no. dial would be much nicer in my mind. Yeah. The swiping is never precise, is it? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the button on there is also very reminiscent of the Apple Watch button. Right. Although not, not quite the same shape, but it's like a pill shape, maybe slightly shorter and fatter. Uh, and then the speaker or the microphone grills, I guess they are, also look a little like the Apple Watch, but slightly bigger. So it's a very <laughs> Apple looking product, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. And the, of course, the first response, and I think it is warranted, is the price of the headphones. $549 US, is that right? And $899 right. Australian? Man. It's it's bonkers. I, I don't, I'm not, you know... I'm not headfirst in the headphone market, but I've never seen uh, headphones this expensive before. <laughs> and uh, it's hard to know what they're competing with because I think most people are, would balk at spending like $300 on a pair of headphones. And these are like almost double that. I think the most expensive Beats headphone are like a third of the cost of these. Right. Yeah, I believe that. I mean, there's certainly headphones that are much more expensive than this. Depending on the quality you want, you can easily get into the thousands of dollars range for really, really nice over-the-ear headphones. Um, I'm not necessarily one to talk or even complain about headphone price. The headphones I'm using right now to record this podcast cost the same amount as these. So I, I certainly understand that there are headphones in this price range. The question is, do these airpods max sound good enough to justify their price and that's something we won't know for another week or so so the headphones you've got on now are they wireless they are not they're wired right are there any really expensive headphones that are wireless Uh, i do not know that i there i'm sure there are but i'm i'm definitely not well enough versed in the headphone scene (laughs) to to have any off the top of my head no, when I think either. about things that come to mind that these are competing with, it's like the the Bose um, QC35s and the generation that came after, was that the headphone 700 or something like that? Yeah, uh, aren't they much cheaper though? Yeah, right. They're, we're talking about $350-ish for those in the competing Sony MX 0004X or whatever they're called, or WM4X. Um, but yeah, those are high-end consumer over the ear noise canceling headphones and they're usually sit around 350 and these seem yeah. to be aiming for a, a higher market kind of in the same way the original home pod was it seemed like it overshot whatever market they were aiming for but they were going for the more high high fi high quality audio market with those with the original home pod and it feels like this is kind of the same thing the yeah the home pod I think it was in within reach though. Sure. It was compared to this. Because yeah, these are... like the HomePod went into the market Yeah, slightly above well what are what are the there weren't really many smart speakers that had great audio on the market. Basically so just, the Sonos was all they were compared against at that time. The Son- yeah, and that was that even smart? I don't think it had any voice at controls at the time even though now it's got uh, pretty much everything yeah. but hmm. the airpods max are coming into a market where this stuff like already exists and works like you know I, I don't see what it's bringing that makes it worth twice as much as an expensive like what most consumers would already consider 
expensive headphones. And then for the like the audio files who are spending like thousands on headphones, I don't think they listen to audio over Bluetooth. Well, these can be used wired as well. Oh, okay. Well, that's news to me. Mm. Yeah, it's an extra $35, but you can get a lightning to 3.5 millimeter cable to use these wired. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Huh. Kind of sounds a little bit un <laughs> to do that sort of thing. <laughs> I was surprised they put lightning on these. Yeah, that's a shock, isn't it? I mean, not even the last uh, Beats headphones were lightning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I don't know. I'm a, I want these to get the hands of an audiophile and start seeing some reviews. I want to hear someone say if these actually do justify their price just on audio quality alone because it's totally possible especially with as we we're talking about earlier how good apple's gotten at audio engineering in the last few years mm-hmm. there's a secondary market here that's very much the luxury good uh the price isn't a deterrent it actually is an encourage it's like encouraging like now it's a status symbol to own these because they're almost six hundred dollars so mm-hmm. you'd buy it just to say look i'm wearing the six hundred dollar apple headphones and, and that there's a real group of people that would go for it just for that reason. And and I am at least slightly ashamed to say that that is probably one of the more enticing factors for me right now. <laughs> think of how cool I'd be if I had these headphones. You'd be incredibly cool, David. Oh, I know. Even that's without the... them. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm definitely not rushing out to buy $500 headphones anytime soon. But uh, I am anxious to get to try them on at some point in the future. I just, besides you, I don't think I know anyone who would even consider buying these at the price. <laughs> I'll buy anything if it's shiny and made by Apple. <laughs> A few other design notes is that the, uh, the part that goes over your head, it's probably got an actual name. But it, it looks like only, sorry? Canopy. The Canopy. It looks like only some stretchy fabric is going to be touching your head, Mm -hmm. which is very nice because I I find like the most over the head headphones that I've used become uncomfortable fairly quickly. That's going to be especially important with these because they weigh twice as much as those QC35s that we were comparing them to earlier. Oh, you're joking. Twice as much. I believe that was the number I saw earlier today. Yeah. I mean, these are made of metal, so they're going to they're mm. weigh more. Wow. Also, the magnetically attaching ear cups uh, are interchangeable, and you can buy different colored sets from Apple for $70 mm, if you want to okay. mix and match. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> look cool. <laughs> Potentially. I couldn't come up with any color combinations that looked especially good in my mind. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, how about that charging case, though? It's not a charging case. <laughs> Oh, it's just a case. Just a well, case. they call it a smart case, right? It's like a smart cover it has on an iPad. In it. Mm, yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Well, that's true to form then. <laughs> very, very odd. They aren't. These are not especially portable. You can't fold them up and st- stow them very well. And the case seems to exist solely to put the headphones into an ultra low power mode, so they can sit for, I don't know, a month at a time without just draining their battery searching for a signal because there's no on and off switch on them right so the case is the on and off switch right kind of except it's not truly off it's the on and sleep switch Mm -hmm. yeah very interesting choice there as well (laughs) um they have spatial audio of course still waiting for those to come to the lowly regular airpods right notably no u1 chip in these ah okay so you're not going to find them when you lose them? Right. There is a little bit of debate since they haven't actually been torn down yet. Um, the U1 chip's not mentioned in the, technical spec, in the technical docs. And it sounded like at some point a reporter reached out to Apple to ask and was told it wasn't there. But there's still a little bit of speculation online that maybe at some point in the future when the U1 has more use, they'll be like, actually, look, it does have U1. But... I think that's wishful thinking more than anything at this point. Yeah, considering that they announced it on like, what was the first iPhone with it? The 11 Pro? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, it's got a U1. Don't 
dot. Well, all the all (laughs) all the features the UN can be used for make no sense right now in headphones until they reveal the find my stuff hopefully sometime early next year and they show how you can find your headphones with it it makes no sense for the un ship to be in there so they're just being secretive to try and keep it on the lowdown that this is coming even though everyone knows it is coming (laughs) well we'll know in a week when i fix it tears these apart yeah true yeah Uh, 20 hours of battery of uh, listening time on the battery and then plug it in yeah, but then you plug it in with the lightning connector. I guess they're waiting for the iPhone to go USB C before that these go before these go USB C. I guess. Yeah, because all the other AirPods also charge via lightning. That's right. But their accessories are USB C now. Or at least the beats are and some of their chargers are. I don't know. It's a weird it's a weird time for chargers. Mm. Yeah. And with expensive headphones like these that you'd probably anticipate buying and using for many years. Uh, you know these are going to outlive the lightning port. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's going to be like when you had that, you know, the last hi-fi system that you had, which still had a 30-pin connector, but it was good so you didn't throw it away for ages, that sort of scenario. Right. <laughs> yeah, imagine just being able to put a MagSafe puck on the side of one of these to charge it. Why didn't they? It seems like such an obvious choice. Right, yeah, it'd be perfect. Maybe there wasn't space? Nah, surely well, there would be. Rumors are that these were much more feature-rich a month ago when they were still working on them. And they were going to have touch sensors on the sides. And so maybe they couldn't have MagSafe at that point. There was no way the design to go was, back and edit it. Wasn't, wasn't finalized a month ago. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they very easily could have had multiple designs being developed in parallel and opted for the lower tech one. Hmm. So if you had a MagSafe puck, is there enough flat surface area to attach it on the side? That's a good question. Some of these photos, they look very flat on the side, but in some, they look slightly more round. So I'm not actually yeah. sure the exact shape of these headphones. And then because they also don't, Oh, no, they do turn sideways. I was going to think they don't fold up, so it would kind of be like dangling in the air, but you could Mm -hmm. just put it on this sideways. Right. Or even build it into the smart case somehow. Or the bra case, as everyone seems to be calling it on Reddit. (laughs) Right. I don't know. I'm I'm excited to hear some reviews, though. I think these are going to be better than people are giving them credit for. Oh, I hope so. I hope they deliver the quality that the price demands. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there was also a rumor a month ago that these were going to come out at this price point, but there was also going to be like a quote unquote sport variant that was made of plastic instead of metal. And it was going to be closer to the $350 price point that people kind of expect. It certainly sounds like a, like a reasonable thing to, to happen. Right. But I would have thought they'd just be announced at the same time if they were going to do that. I mean, if it's anything like the way they treat the SE, We'll get it in six months after everyone that wants to buy the premium ones have already bought them up. That is a, a, um, what's the word? That is an Apple tactic, isn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. So Apple Music now works on Google Assistant speakers. Follows the trend of Apple Music coming to lots of things like Android and TVs, I guess. Uh, Yeah. Sonos has Apple Music, doesn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. I think, I actually don't know now that I'm going to say it, if the, the Echoes... I think they do. Oh, yeah, they yes, do. Yes, they do. Yep. So the yeah, Google Assistant their, is like the last thing. Bringing their services to everything between this and Apple TV+. Plus, You can pretty much get it anywhere now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was pretty happy to see this. I still have a Google Home Mini kicking around. And, uh, yeah, it doesn't hurt. It certainly doesn't put out the best audio quality, but just right. to, you know fill a gap in a in the house somewhere with music sometimes for the price of a google home mini which is like google nest mini rather which is you know they basically get thrown at you as you walk down the street (laughs) so cheap (laughs) right yeah they're bundled with everything Mm -hmm. yep although getting rid of my last google product (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah at one point i had like three of them i think 
nest minis, but uh, I'm down to one now, and I kind of wish I'd kept a few of the others. <laughs> Just gonna replace them but, all with HomePod minis. Yes, that, that's a long term tactic. Although it's sometimes mm-hmm. nice to have like a, a different assistant, a smarter assistant. Yeah, yep, yeah, smarter, <laughs> <laughs> different. <laughs> Sadly, Australia is not on the launch list. Sorry, it's probably still six months away from me at least. You'll get it after you get Apple Pay Cash. No, that's never coming. It's never <laughs> leaving the United States. Is it just in the US? As far as I know. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the topics for the day. I saw you threw ferrite in here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just I completely forgot it was a shared note when I typed that in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say that um, I was going to try editing this show using Ferrite on the MacBook mm-hmm. Air because I did have a little go at um, using the Apple configurator to, to grab the IPA files for a few apps that you can't natively get through the Mac App Store, but yeah, okay. will work. So, so far I've chucked uh, Instagram on there, uh, Ferrite on there. I think that's it, actually. Nice. But yeah, uh, while I've got this handy, I'm going to see just, yeah, how that works and edit the show together on Ferrite and, yeah, I'll report back. Well, I guess I can give a report on trying to put the video version of the episode together uh, from a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, I struggled quite a bit. Uh, first of all, I thought I would just use iMovie, uh, which unfortunately does not let you layer mo- more than one thing on at a time. So what I have is traditionally our our podcast artwork with the gradient behind it, and then you and I on either, either side. And to do that with iMovie, I'd have to put one of us on the video, export the whole video, and then put the other one on and export the video again. So that didn't work. So I decided to uh give LumaFusion a shot on the Mac since that is an app you can just get through the Mac App Store. Um and it took some getting used to first of all because some of the conventions from a touchscreen don't track very well uh, with a mouse. So the idea of trying to move a video file down into my my timeline instead of just being able to click and drag it in, I've got to like click and hold on it until it pops up and then I can move it around. Mm, okay. And then once I had done that and got the video how I liked it and tried to export it, I got a, a error message a few times, something about not being able to verify my purchase. And I thought that was just it. And I, I think I told you at the time that this just isn't going to work and was going to opt for Final Cut as a last-ditch solution to get this to work. Uh, but I did eventually, after enough enough clicks, get it to export. Um. But then I ran into an interesting behavior issue with iOS apps on the Mac. If they are not in focus, they just stop running. <laughs> of course, right, yes. <laughs> so I started exporting, and then I like pulled up Safari or something while I was waiting for it to export, and I got a an error message pop up that said that you know you've you've closed out of uh, LumaFusion while exporting, and so you need to restart it or whatever. So I had to leave that window front and center <laughs> while I was doing that. Oh, that is truly funny. <laughs> uh, but it was just as fast as it would have been on my iPad Pro, probably even a little faster. Uh, but definitely not a very comfortable experience to use iOS apps on the Mac, in my experience. I do enjoy getting like proper notifications for the iOS apps on the Mac. Mm-hmm. Because for apps like, say you're running the Mac App Store version of facebook messenger or you need to have it open to get notifications whereas if you install like the iphone ipad version of facebook messenger you don't have to have it open to get notifications just as if as if it was on an iphone or ipad so i don't know if that's if it's possible for an app to show notifications while not running on a computer and it's just the developers don't support it or what But I do enjoy not having to have an app running to get notifications for it. Right, yeah. I've enjoyed that with uh, Apollo on my Mac quite a bit. Ah, yes. Uh, Overcast is the other app I installed. Of course, that is on the 
Mac apps, iPhone store, whatever you, whatever mm-hmm. we call it now. <laughs> the Mac iPhone store. I don't know why this is different in my mind, but whenever I visit a website and a browser and I get a prompt to subscribe to notifications from that website, I've never hit yes on that because for some reason my desktop environment isn't something I want to be cluttered with, with notifications like I get on my mm-hmm. phone. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the moment I start getting apps, I, I'm excited about it. I'm like, oh, I, fi- I installed Apollo and now I get my Reddit notifications on my Mac. This is great. Even though I theoretically probably could have done that by subscribing to notifications through the Reddit website itself. I don't know if any notifications work with Safari. Oh, really? Do you use Safari or Chrome? Uh, I use Safari on my Mac. Okay. But I do do most of my work on a Windows computer, so maybe I'm thinking more of that. Yeah. I would I would definitely say yes, I think, as a default, unless it was just like some news website, which always seemed to want to you know, subscribe to notifications. Mm-hmm. But I don't think I've ever actually seen one in Safari, whereas every time I launch Chrome, which I have just as like a backup, then I just get, you know, immediately spammed with a bunch of notifications as soon as I open it, the ones that have just queued up waiting to be sent. Huh. Okay. Yeah, well, I've never hit yes to even know if they worked or not. <laughs> mm, yeah, I don't think they do. So last show, we chucked in a bunch of audio from your MacBook Pro's microphones, which is the three studio array microphones. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did you... Well, you would have listened to it. What did you think? It was okay. (laughs) I, I, I don't know if I would have called them studio quality, but maybe if my setup was a little different and it wasn't sitting a foot and a half away from me on a desk and I was closer to it, we could mimic the sound quality I have with this microphone, but it's not going to just, it's not going to just work and sound as good as my regular podcasting setup does. What about you? What were your thoughts? The biggest problem I had with it was just a low level noise that came along with the audio. And I'm sure with, without too much work, I could have removed that, but I didn't want to, I just wanted to leave it in there as, as it came. Right. But I think it could probably be polished up to sound a lot better than it did. Um, yeah. One thing so, I did notice, uh, I I, don't, I just rub my hands, I guess, when we talk. And usually you can't hear that in the podcast, but as soon as you switched over my laptop microphones, you could hear me rubbing my hands when we were talking. Really? Yeah. I didn't pick that up as I was editing it. Oh, okay. So you're just always doing it? I'll, uh, I'll no, not back. always. It's, it's not like a, a regular thing, but I don't know. I guess I speak with my hands quite a bit. And so I had quite a few gestures I was making while I was talking about the new MacBook Pro that for some reason my hands were going together and apart a lot. And I could just hear my hands like rubbing on each other. It stood <laughs> out to me. I'm surprised you couldn't hear it. I'll go back and listen. And okay. See if I can pick it up. <laughs> it's that Italian heritage, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Da- yep, Davide Italian. Fremano. <laughs> How many languages do you speak, James? Three. English, German, and Italian. <laughs> Italian, really? That's a, that's a bit of a bold claim. So I used to speak Italian pretty close okay. to fluently, but mm-hmm. we are talking 15 years ago. So I'm, I'm sure with a bit of work, I could get back there, but uh, yeah, I'll claim three. Okay. And I, I struggle with English. <laughs> <laughs> Your English is better than mine. What are you talking about? Is it better than yours? Yeah. I don't know how we could compare English. I don't think I've ever thought yours was poor. Look, who's the one that does crosswords every week? <laughs> I do the very easy crosswords. If it's if it's harder than a Monday crossword puzzle, I'm probably not going to finish it. Ooh, the Mondays, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't get my crosswords on a Monday, actually. So I couldn't compare. Wait, when do you when when do you do your crosswords? <laughs> Never, but mm. they do come okay. in like the weekend papers. I mean, they I come see. in all papers, but I only ever see the papers on the weekend. Ah, uh, okay. Well, I'm James VDM on Reddit and Twitter, and I'm Jelly Woot on Reddit and Twitter. And you'll find the show notes at reddit.com/r/theRappleshow. <laughs> what? Do you ever do the Reddit Secret Santa stuff? 
I did the first two years. I think I've got the inaugural badge or whatever you call it for the Reddit Secret Santa. And I think I yeah, did that one and then maybe the next mid-year one and then the next Christmas one, but not since. Oh, okay. What year was the inaugural one? Let me quickly pull up my trophy case. <laughs> uh, here we go. Actually, I've got a few more than that. I did Secret Santa 2009, Summer mm-hmm. Santa 2010 and 2011, and also Secret okay. Santa 2010 and 2014. Okay. My first Secret Santa, I think, was 2013, but I also did 2014. We could have matched with each other. What if we did and we just don't remember? I mean, it's possible. Um, I'm trying to remember what I got for my first couple Secret Santas. I got... A blue screen of death t-shirt for my very first secret santa oh that's cool my second year i got sent a shirt that said department of redundancy department and a couple <laughs> okay. of clown noses <laughs> uh, yeah. then i didn't do 2015 i did 2016 and in 2016 i got matched with a really sweet woman who who sent sent stuff for me and all my kids and it was it was really awesome oh wow nice uh, but 2016 was the last time i did secret santa until this year i signed up again to to try it out mm-hmm. and we just got our matches on monday and i already got a notification from my secret santa they had already shipped me multiple gifts and to expect them in like next week multiple wow yeah you got lucky i guess so, I mean, Secret Santa is basically just gambling anyway. Everyone's just hoping to get Bill Gates. Exactly. Is he still involved? <laughs> I mean, I think he has every year so far. That's good. So, I mentioned the podcast in there, though. So, if he knows that I have a podcast about Apple, I'll probably get coal. <laughs> <laughs> He's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I just logged on to my Reddit Gifts account. I actually apparently also took part of the R Books 2011 exchange. <laughs> oh, cool. What else have we got here? I think you can been on can't you find lot, like photos of your presents. Uh, if you uploaded them, mm. I can definitely find some of mine. Let me... Let's see if I can find my very first. So actually, you said you took part in the 2014 one, mm-hmm. didn't you? Let me see. 2013, 2014, 2016 are the three that I've done prior to this one. I, I can't see where I would find any evidence, though, of, of my own um, gift sent or received. There's a gallery for all the give the Secret Santas, but there's not really a way to search the gallery. Not especially helpful. Oh, I can retrieve my match. Oh, if you oh, click right. thank so- your Santa, you can see your thank you note that you gave oh really cool uh, i didn't get you by the way thank you santa <laughs> uh, uh here we go i got a uh an itunes gift card of 30 dollars. oh very nice that's... oh and you can see the picture as well cool okay so that's what i got in 2014 so i have to figure out something good for my for my uh gifty this year mm. it's she, I don't know. I think she's made it kind of easy. I got a very, very long description about who I'm giving to this year. So, lots precisely of... what she wants. No, I kind of wish it was just a <laughs> gift list, though. Yeah, that's so much easier than like I just like. There's some vague stuff like I really like crafting, and like okay, I I can't really do much with that unless you really just like all forms of crafting. Mm. I can figure out something but... for my workplace secret Santa. I matched with my manager, of course. Like, mm-hmm. of course, you're going to match with your immediate manager. But as of yet, he hasn't invited me to the Christmas party. So my plan Ooh. is that if he doesn't invite me, he doesn't get a present. Which is <laughs> just showing the nasty side of my personality and character. <laughs> <laughs> because I assume the party is on the opposite side of the country for you. That's right, but I still ex- I'm not going, but I still expect to be invited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very very petty. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um my office had did an interesting thing for the holiday party this year. Uh because 
COVID is still such a big deal in this country. Uh, we obviously couldn't get together for it. So we did uh, some online events instead through Zoom calls. One of them was a Zoom magician. What? Okay. Yeah, it was, cool. it, was it, it actually ended up being pretty neat. Yeah, because uh, his stage manager had control of the whole Zoom call and could bring people in and out of the show. So he actually was able to interact with the audience in that way and do tricks with them. And it, it, hmm. it actually worked out pretty neat. Magic is a little less believable over video, but it was mm -hmm. it was a, a cool idea since we couldn't get together this year. What sort of sort of tricks did he do via video? I'm trying to think of a really good example. He had he had this is crazy. He uh, he asked if anyone had access to a deck of cards, and one of the people watching had a nearby deck of cards, and so. He had them pick a random card from their deck, and then he had a deck where he turned one card around the opposite direction in the deck, and then they pulled a card out of their deck, and then he showed that that was the card that was backwards in his deck, and that oh, was a neat trick. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I wish I could... I need to look up his name, because I, th I don't know if you would know it, but he's apparently a fairly famous magician. Justin Willman? Mm, no, it doesn't ring a bell. Mm. Well, he he's a intro video that played before the show started he was on a lot of late night talk shows and he had clips of him doing shows for celebrities so i assumed he was famous but i never heard of him before either so mm. no his face doesn't look familiar to me either ah, okay well i'm gonna take just a minute to brag about myself mm -hmm. please do okay cool this is actually like partially an accountability thing too like, I'm going to have you hold me to something here. Okay. I uh, decided to, like, work really hard on uh, weight loss two months ago. Mm -hmm. And and as of this point of two months of focusing on really diet and exercise, I'm down uh, just about 16 kilos. 16 um, kilos in two months? Yep. That's yeah. insane. That's about halfway. So that's just almost about 35 pounds for... <laughs> for everyone in the u.s um so i'm about halfway to my my goal which the second half is gonna take a lot longer than the first half but i'm saying it here on the podcast that i'm gonna commit to doing that again losing another 16 kilos so that you can hold me accountable and i don't get lazy now well i'll join you like what's your secret uh Man, there's there's definitely no no secret to it for me. Uh, I'm not one that prescribes to like fad diets or anything. Um, it's really just like calories in, calories out. That's all that matters. Yeah. And so I'm just like really watching what I eat. And it's actually been a little hard now that the weather's getting cold here. But I was doing mm. like lots of regular walking and and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, mostly mostly just watching watching what I eat. It's been so easy being uh, in a, kind of this just this perpetual lockdown for the whole year. Just like be constantly grazing when my kitchen is always a few steps away from where I'm working. Wow, that's my uh, life. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I'm trying to take that real seriously, and now I, now I have you and however many hundreds of listeners decided to wait this long into the show to listen to hold me accountable. So how do you how do you just keep it going? So <laughs> my problem is that like every other week I think oh, I should really focus on what I'm eating, but then mm -hmm. like 2 minutes later basically I've forgotten and I go and have an ice cream. So how have you <laughs> maintained that for 2 months? Uh so so this is I guess another uh symptom of of living in lockdown is i've become really really susceptible to like all these online subscription services um since since going lockdown i've become a me undies subscriber and i get <laughs> underwear in the mail every week or every month and it's great what i think it's really cool why do you need so much <laughs> underwear do you just I mean, not wash it you just chuck it in the bin like single use <laughs> <laughs> one pair a month is not that much especially Versus what going out and buying a pack of boxers like what five or six? I still haven't even gotten that many. So all right. Anyway, that's kind of fun. Um, but another thing is subscription meal services that I decided to try out. Uh, the one I'm using is called 
dinnerly. And it's like a meal prep kit. They just send you fresh ingredients every week and a few recipes. Mm, and like a hello fresh. And really Yeah, Hello Fresh, Blue Apron, there's all kinds of stuff. What I'm doing is called dinnerly and um it's cut down on my shopping a lot because I can get I get most of my meals for the week just in that meal kit. Mm-hmm. And by not going out and, and buying food myself and having a lot of extra junk food around is just like, this is my food for the week. And I'm going to have to spread it out over the week. That's basically how I've been managing it. Mm, nice. So you never have the temptation of walking into the shopping, the supermarket and, you know, seeing that stacks of chocolate at the end of each row on special. <laughs> right. Wow. Okay. I'm not really in charge of food in my house. So it's a little bit tricky to do, to try and do something right. like that. But I'm, I mean, yeah, I'm thoroughly impressed. Thanks. I'm a little proud. I think that's why I brought it up. But yeah, you should be. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, over the course of the last five years, since my daughter was born, I'd gained, yeah, just over. 30 kilos and um i don't know i'm finally ready to get back down to where where i where i was that long ago mm. uh, mostly okay. because i never wanted to admit defeat and buy clothes that the right were the right size for me as i have been <laughs> my entire life saying no this is not permanent i'm gonna get back down to my old weight so i have boxes of like all the old clothes i was wearing five years ago mm-hmm. and yep. no clothes that i like that actually fit me so now i've got to lose weight if i want to actually wear nice clothes again mm. yep well, I think the time in your life when you are having children and they're young is a fairly typical time to, you know, balloon a little bit. Um, <laughs> I, I find myself that I'm basically at the limit of what my clothes can fit. <laughs> um, yeah. So, understandable. That and I kind of want to walk into the office in another, well, it's going to be like six months before I can go back to the office still. Things are crazy here. But when I do, I don't want my coworkers to recognize me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. We didn't even that actually, actually Yeah. Oh no, go ahead. Oh, this is this is vaguely related, but that just remind me of this like skit thing that I s not a skit, no, it was like a um a prank, I guess you could say, on YouTube where a guy had his maybe 10 or 15 at high school reunion and he actually hired an actor that kind of looked like him but was way better looking and much trimmer to go in in place of him and okay. it utterly failed and fell on its face because no one thought it was him oh man yeah anyway go I've on got, i've got my 10 year high school reunion coming in just a couple of years oh nice i was going to comment that we never, never even got to the actual topics of, of today the topics what do you mean I thought we did. Uh, a- Apple confirms family sharing for in-app purchases and Apple preps ah, next Mac chips. I didn't look down that far. <laughs> I thought that was last week's show. No, that's my fault for trying to put subheadings over the different sections, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's too late now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's save them for next week. Next okay. fortnight. They they weren't super interesting topics. The new the new headphones were the most interesting thing anyway. Uh yeah, that's true, yeah. Yep. I actually didn't even read uh about the next Mac chips. That was just something from Bloomberg, but I never got around to reading the article because I never re looked at it. No, oh, it was very, very uh vague anyway. It was like written for investors and it mostly just was an accumulation of rumors going around there was no specific details or new information it's just apple is working on the next m m whatever chips and they're going to have more cores Uh, okay one of those things are getting better apple hopes to improve current products right cool all right 